today we're going to talk about compassion stress. We're going to talk about personnel satisfaction. All of you have skills when you come into this field. You're learning things. You all come in because you love animals and you want to help them. And as you grow your skills, you become more and more valuable to our profession. But a lot of people leave our profession, not because of money, not because they don't enjoy the work, but they just can't take it anymore. And so that's what we want to talk about, is how do we build that resilience? So I am often asked, how did the director of animal relocation for the ASPCA end up talking about compassion fatigue and compassion stress? And the answer is sort of a long story that I'll shorten down. Um, I was an educator in the veterinary technology program in Tennessee, and I taught technicians first um, compassion stress as a part of their program in veterinary technology. I wanted them to be advocates that went out into the field that understood how to take care of not just themselves, but others in the practice so that when they were put in roles of practice management or they were put in roles of leaders of something like this, that they knew what they were talking about and they knew the type of help that they could bring to their practice so that those staff members would want to stay. And so that was my original goal. So I worked in animal welfare back in the early 90s. I was the director of animal control. I was an animal control officer. I was the shelter manager. And I was the only certified euthanasia technician on staff. So in the early 90s, about 70% to 80% on bad years of our population was euthanized. And at the end of that year, every time I looked at that number, that was all me. So you can imagine, that's a horrible feeling to look at thousands of animals and think, I touched every one of you. So even though I did that in a compassionate way, it drove me out of this profession. And I left, and for five years I did a much less stressful thing and I ran my own restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, then animal welfare started to look pretty good. Um, and, and I came back to the field, but I came back with a really different feeling about who I wanted to be, where I wanted to go in this field, and where we would hopefully go. And so like other people like me, we set about making a lot of changes. We wanted things to be different. We knew what it felt like to spend every day on the other end of a needle, which is a horrible, horrible feeling, even when you're doing smaller numbers. It's tough, it's difficult. So you have to be able to wrap your mind around the work that we do and think about the positives that you bring and work your way into becoming a resilient person that can tolerate the work that we do so we don't lose all of the wonderful things that you bring with you as an individual. Does that make sense to everybody? Does that sound easy? No, it's not easy, which is why there's so many of us that come to sessions like this over and over. So I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm somebody that understands this work and that went out and got a certification in compassion fatigue because I wanted to do this. Because I think that I bring a unique view to this in that I know what it feels like to be in the worst of the worst situations. I've deployed, I've done all sorts of different work that's the hard work to do. So when I'm talking to you, I'm not talking as a therapist at all or as a psychologist. I'm just talking to you as one of you that's been there. And I do animal relocation. <laughs> so without you and people like you as we're talking, this work just won't happen. Once there's no more of us that are willing to not only love the animals, but put ourselves personally out there to do the work. Sorry, there's a microphone there. <laughs> There's no one to help anymore. So we have to help each other and support each other to stay in this work. In our work, animal relocation, when we hire on lovely people like Savannah here who does our work, we talk about relocating animals, about taking animals from source shelters to destination shelters. But what we don't really talk about a lot is when you're part of the ASPCA, you get pulled into everything that happens. And so we started off just doing relocation and then our disaster response team saw that we're a fleet of vehicles that know how to move animals efficiently and well, that our people are trained, that we know what we're doing, and we became an arm of the fur team as well. So when there's a disaster, our team deploys as well, and we move animals out of the way of the disaster, or we actually go down and participate in the disaster with them, which requires a different set of skills. So some of our relocation drivers, like Savannah, do a great job going down and deploying and being involved in those things, and some people that's not the best work for. So when you're looking at your team, it doesn't mean that they're lacking in some way. If they can't do the hardest of the hard, you should choose the correct people for the work so that you don't end up burning them out. 
Need can often be greater than resources. When I was a shelter director, we helped in the Caboodle Ranch case. Was anybody in the industry when Caboodle Ranch happened? Wow, now I'm really old. <laughs> uh, 600 cats in a Florida sanctuary. Um, started off with great intentions, really cute place. Um, ended up completely out of control and overwhelmed, which often happens. And so as you can imagine, these cats had lived in the community wild there in this huge cat sanctuary. Many of them were ill, um, many of them were feral, and the job for us was to go in and capture them all. Um, I worked in a shelter at that time, so my team helped deploy and work on that. I didn't work with the ASPCA, but it um, made me an advocate for the organization, and I was really proud when I was hired here. So you must not let you, this eat you alive. If you have days where you're feeling like, I just can't do this anymore, that's the, before you get to that stage is when you need to start taking care of yourself. And we're going to talk about that today, about self-care, about the things that you can do, not only for yourself, but the things that you should bring back to your team. So back when I was first starting in sheltering, we were all in little Morton buildings, little uh, metal Morton buildings. And the problem with a metal Morton building is that metal rusts. And so as you wash the building and you clean up after the animals, metal rusts, and you'd ended up with these terrible facilities that couldn't be disinfected. And then you had a trench drain that went all the way down behind the animals, and every animal got to paddle in everybody else's poop and pee from the trench drain. So you can imagine how much that helps with parvo and diseases like that. So really awful things that happened, people focused on, people decided there needed to be change, people specialized in building animal shelters and working together and really amazing things have happened. If you haven't been to any of the really large shelters in this country, do it. It's incredible what exists out there for animals now by comparison. In just about 15 to 20 years, things have changed dramatically from where they were when I started. That doesn't mean the work is easier, but mission-driven people make this work possible. The same as people that help children, people that are rape crisis counselors, people that stop sex trafficking. All of these people are like us, They've just chosen a different mission. So this organization over here is a very small organization in Northeast Arkansas, uh, mostly volunteers. They're one of our transport partners. And they do great work with very few people in very poor circumstances because they've decided as a, as a group that they're going to support each other and work together. So whether your staff is 1,000 or your staff is 10, working together and supporting each other is the key not just on your own team, but on all those other teams that are in your community too. Veterinarians in the room? Any? They're all the DVM, hi. They're all on the DVM track. So people that work with veterinarians, veterinarians on your team. So this is really important to know. There's a lot of pressure on veterinarians in private practice. There's a lot of pressure on veterinarians that work in our field. And some of that pressure can come internally from veterinarians who've learned all of these things but aren't able to practice them with us. We really need a veterinarian in order to do our work, right? We can't do any of our work. We can't, we can't vaccinate. We can't do any of our work without a veterinarian. So they have to be a part of our team. But veterinarians commit suicide or think of suicide in our field more than any other field. So if you look at this, on the right here, this is the population of the United States, okay? This is how many people in that population experience what's on the left there. So psychological distress. 4.4% of females in this country have psychological distress, but 11% of female veterinarians have psychological distress. That's almost three times the number. So that team member who's so crucial to our work really needs to be a team member that's very supported in our community. Whether that veterinarian is a private practice veterinarian who's working with the shelter that may also get beaten up by other people in the community because he's supporting our spay-neuter clinic or something like that, that's all stress that they deal with on top of what they deal with with the public. And without them, there's no work. So we really need to think about that when we're hiring a veterinarian and when we're supporting staff, that this staff member is very at risk. So longevity and animal welfare. Some of us have been around a long time, took a break, came back. Some of you are very new to this. But if this is what you want to do, survival is not enough. 
You don't want to be the person that has survived this, that's bitter, that's exhausted all the time. You want to be the people who are building compassion resilience for yourself and others. And I'm going to say that a bunch of times. Compassion resilience is an expression you should start to use in your normal vocabulary in your shelter. Mary's really having a hard time. She cries pretty much every day now. She goes in the bathroom to do it so she doesn't upset anybody else. But her compassion resilience is non-existent. So we need to think about Mary and support her, not just say, oh, poor Mary, she's in the bathroom again. Does anybody ever, has anybody ever seen that? Does that ring true in your organization, the people that are just crying? I was talking to an ASPCA staff member who had deployed with FUR for the first time, and she said, I was so proud of myself. I got through that whole thing. I did this great job. It was really hard. I saw all these terrible things. I came back home. I was only there a few days. I came back home, and I went to our Humane Awards luncheon. And at our Humane Awards luncheon, we nominate people, and we uh, give them an award for their contribution. And it's an emotional thing, because you're telling people, Gosh, this amazing work that you've done. And they show videos and things of the amazing work that they've done. And she said she was supposed to be there to support the ASPCA and to be there in the organization and do what Savannah's doing and support speakers. And she just fell apart at the, at the wonderful things that she was seeing. And she realized it was because she was carrying with her all the terrible things that she had just seen. So when people come back from a terrible cruelty case, Deploying with fur, some of you may deploy with us, those kinds of things. Make sure those people get that additional support that they need. Think of the people that you know in this field that have been around for a long time. What characteristics do they have that help them cope with this work, that help them support all of you in this work? Or maybe you're one of them. Any characteristics you think that those people have that make them able to be resilient? They set boundaries. Leave work at work. Who else? Just shout out. It's Cornell. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> a sense of humor. A sense of humor. Really important. Laughing is really important. I love it when we go to visit shelters and people are laughing and joking with each other. A lot of family support. Family support. People that also believe in the mission and support us in doing it. A way to release the stress and, and what you've seen. Not hide it in, but release it emotionally. Right, way to get it out. People you can talk to, different ways to get it out. Anything else, anyone you can think of that you're like, wow, I wish I was like them? No, Sorry? Team building. Team building. Mm -hmm. Working together, supporting each other. Really important that you support each other in this work. If you go to work every day and you feel supported, no matter how good the day is or how bad the day is, and that everybody works together and nobody's blaming each other, it's, it's so helpful to have people stay. So self-care is not selfish, it's self-respect. Here's where we start to fall apart a little bit as a group of people in that, but wait a minute, there's still 25 more animals coming in. You can't leave. We all have to stay. We have to stay till this is done. That might be true, but look at who you're asking to stay and what's happening to them and think about what it would be like tomorrow if that person who's on the edge isn't there anymore because they couldn't stay. So building a network amongst yourselves, inviting volunteers in, trying to build the, the level of people that can come in and help you, allowing your volunteers to do more, trusting the volunteers that they can learn. If you hired them, they would be a staff member. So as a volunteer, they should be able to be trained to help you and support you so that the people that are there doing the core work that see the really hard things get a break too. So think about that, that they're not being selfish when they leave. We're respecting them for the work that they do for us. Now, there may be somebody that cuts out all the time at 2 o'clock no matter what's going on. That's a different situation. That's an HR situation. But <laughs> if they start just going over the edge, you need to see that, recognize it, know what it looks like at your organization, and work your way through that. Respect each other for the work that you do. So we're going to do something that's really hard for us because we're doers, right? We like to get out. We like to do stuff. My father was director of, world, of the personnel for the World Bank. So I grew up living in different places. And in the 70s, I lived in Japan. And in Japan, they are much better at self-care than we are. And that's because even their national companies support the care of their people. They start out their day with exercise. They start out their day with quiet meditation. 
And by doing that, they start their day feeling refreshed instead of coming in frazzled with all of your stuff that you're carrying, trying to get through the door with you know, the kids on the phone because they forgot something at school. They have to leave all of those things outside of their space and go in and, and do meditation. Can we put the lights down just a little bit? So we're going to do this for two minutes. Two minutes. I'll just be two minutes. I'll be there in two minutes, right? It doesn't seem like a long time. We use it as a small piece of time all the time. But for two minutes, you're seated already. I want you to close your eyes and just breathe. Just deep breathe in, breathe out. I'm going to set a little timer here. OK, go. That was two minutes. How many people found that really hard? <laughs> Stephanie, she's like, oh my god. Yeah, it's hard to just to sit for two minutes and do absolutely nothing. You're like, really? Is that two minutes? Wasn't that five? Wasn't it? It's hard to do two minutes. But it's one thing that you could bring into your organization. You could say, twice a day for five minutes, we're not going to run after anybody. We're not going to run around and we're not going to worry about the fact that maybe there's still two litter boxes that haven't been changed. It's time for our five minutes where we just unite as a team and gel. If you can't do five, do two. People will think you're nuts when you start. They'll be like, oh God, they went to a conference. But you will find that over time that just that minute of being in that space has anybody ever had something really difficult happen in their shelter that was, or in their community that was, that was going on that you felt like everywhere you went, when you went to the store or whatever, people would know that you worked at the organization and they were upset with you or angry with you? Or maybe somebody was going to say something mean. Has anybody ever been through that? Okay, so our organization went through that when I was an executive director. And we used to do this and we'd stand in the room and I would say at the beginning of it, we are the same people we have always been. We care just as much as we did yesterday. And what people say is only in this space because it's in your head. It's really not everybody in the community. Most people aren't even that interested in what you're doing. They're not, they don't even know who you are, but you think they do because of the keyboard warriors and the people that are out there that may be like five people in their parents' basement or something. But you bring that in because you let it in. So if you stop that at the beginning of the day and you share the good energy that's in your organization, it starts the day out well. Something to think about. There'll be lots of suggestions. You can take the ones you want. You can come up with your own at some point. So compassion stress. What does that mean? Compassion can cause both good and bad stressors. 
So example of a good stressor. Uh, we've rehabilitated Fluffy. It's taken us three months to rehabilitate Fluffy. She was burned when she came in in a house fire. Her people died. We're all enormously invested in Fluffy, and Fluffy has an adopter. So I came in for, to work this morning, and Fluffy got adopted before I got here. And I didn't get to say goodbye. And I'm the person who cared for Fluffy for all this time, and I'm the person who rehabbed her, and oh my God, who took her? Is she gonna be okay? What were those people like? Did they look good? Did they look sketchy? <laughs> right? It's a feeling that we have. It's a wonderful thing that Fluffy got adopted, even though she had some scarring on her that may go with, for, with her for the rest of her life. But you can't let Fluffy's experience scar you against adopters that are just like you, wanting to love Fluffy too. We heard some yesterday about people talking about um, loving the animals that they have and not trusting anybody so they wouldn't adopt them. And so then you become a sanctuary that helps no more animals. But what makes us different than other people that want to love Fluffy too? People that want to give her a home forever. So that's a good stressor that causes some negative feeling. So we have chosen to work in a compassionate mission, right? We talked about other compassionate missions. People that um, take care of children in Africa that are starving, or people that have AIDS. Like there's a lot of different compassionate missions. Ours just have fur and four legs. So any endeavor at all that alleviates suffering is a compassionate mission. And then a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. When you read that, can you picture some animal that you've helped? Somebody that you went, this is the one, I'm, I'm gonna be able to help this one. Yeah? So the good and bad stressors and the thought that I can help this one, he's just skinny, if we feed him up, he'll do good. But then we have to find a place for him where there's somebody else that can love him. Because our job isn't to become the person that loves him necessarily, unless you're a foster failure, <laughs> or a foster forever, or whatever you wanna call it. But our job is to find placement for this animal. And if you think about it with people that place children that have been abused, they go through the same things we go through with that child. So, a deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. So I was seven, maybe, and I found a tree that had fallen in Virginia where I lived, and the mother raccoon had been crushed. And all of the little baby crack raccoons were going around the tree trying to figure out what had happened to mom. That's the first time I can think of having this intense feeling of compassion for them and that I was the person that needed to help them even though my mother was gonna kill me. And I was sure of it. I didn't know that raccoons could have rabies or any of those kind of things. I just knew that those poor little guys had lost their mom and that I was the person that was gonna help them. But if I brought them home, my mother would know that the raccoons could have rabies and all those things and that I wouldn't be able to help the raccoons. So I went to my friend's house and we put them in her shed and we raised these little raccoons secretly until our parents figured out that we had raccoons and then they went to the um, local wildlife rehabber that I didn't know even existed and I thought, gosh, what a great job. That person rehabilitates animals like this. What we tried to do, they do all the time. That's amazing. And it stuck with me. But that feeling, I'm sure that all of you, if we went around the room, could tell a similar story for the first time that you looked at that animal and you thought, I need to help you. There's something that I can do and I need to help you. But when you get to the end of this, I'm helping, I'm helping, I'm helping, I'm helping, and it stops feeling great and it starts feeling difficult and hard, that's when we need to take that step back and say, okay, I still wanna be that seven-year-old that was scooping up the raccoons. How do I stay there? Okay, so compassion fatigue has been studied um, since the 90s, uh, and the group of people that decided to study this determined that it was very similar to people that were in the military that were experiencing PTSD. That those of us that have done this work have a similar reaction to things that those people do. And they were treating soldiers for PTSD, so they looked at us and nurses and rape crisis counselors and 911 operators and those people that have jobs um, that are also very difficult. And they started deciding what could happen to those caregiving people that would make them last longer in whatever caregiving profession they had chosen. So they identified the phases of compassion fatigue. This is the important part. 
you need to think about these as we go through them and think about who you can recognize in your organization or even in yourself when you've been there in that stage. Because all the time, just like grief, you've heard of like five stages of grief and how when people are grieving, they move through grief stages. Compassion fatigue really isn't that different, except we move back and forth. We go to a bad place, we come back to a good place, depending on what we're doing and where we're doing it. I'm in a good place today. I'm speaking at Cornell. Wow. So compassion fatigue phases are zealot, irritability, withdrawal, and zombie. The zealot is the person that those of us that are farther down the compassion fatigue scale want to strangle on a regular basis. They're brand new. They just got here and everything's amazing. They're the person at the front desk that's like, as you walk in, good morning, we got two new kittens and there's 25 dogs on the way and it's great today. No, we don't have any kennel space, but that's okay, we'll figure it out. Okay, that's your zealot. Volunteers without being asked for everything. Of course I can do that special event this weekend. I'd be happy to be there. Then there's irritability. And you might recognize this as well. This is when you start to think, do we really have to disinfect every kennel? Really? Do I really have to go talk to Mrs. Smith? She's back again, and she wants to talk about her neighbor's dog that's barking again. And we've already done everything we can do right now. You talk about, oh, they're late again. Guess there's something wrong with Mary. She's not here again. And you share that with the whole group so that the atmosphere in the shelter or the clinic gets worse and worse because everybody starts to buy into that. You can suck people into irritability very easily. Hard to suck people into being a zealot, easy to suck people into being irritable. <laughs> and then there's withdrawal. These are the people that spend a lot of time with the animals, almost no time with the people. Hey, we're having lunch together. Merck bought lunch for us and are you gonna come? No thanks, not hungry. Not interested. They call out a lot. They are the people crying in the bathroom. They are the people who may have relationship problems. Um, people that love us love what we do, but they don't love there being none of us in their life anymore. So people that are struggling are people that are in withdrawal. This stage is where all of you start intervening. Of course you're gonna come have pizza with us. Come on, I really need help with this. Come sit down, talk with me while we do this. Can you help me just look at this chart? You're so much better at this than I am. Pull them back in, encourage them away from this feeling, okay? And then there's the zombie phase. This is when people are gone. When we've lost the talent that we've grown. They are absolutely disdainful of the profession or they can't even talk about what we do without being seriously upset and angry. These are the people that, that blog about your organization that have been a part of your organization forever and you know that the things that they're saying aren't really who you are, but they've started to feel that it's this way because we can't fix the problem. I periodically have phone calls from people in shelters that are in this stage that are just desperate for us to help them fix it. And it's hard to be the person taking that call because Yes, we have a national organization, but no, we can't fix everybody's problems everywhere, and that's hard when you want to do those things, when you're compassionate for people, especially, as well as animals. It's hard to say, I can't, I can't help you. How about if we try this? No, no, the ASPCA, you're the ASPCA. Why can't you help me? It's hard. But when people get to this stage, we don't want to say, ugh, she's just done. He's done. We can't deal with him anymore. I am so sick of him coming in here and being upset. This was a person who you once valued. So start to think about what do we value about this person and can we pull them back from this place? Even better, try doing things like the morning meditation or whatever it is you do in your organization to try to stop people from ever getting here. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is easier when we're in tables, so I'm gonna break you all up into groups here. Young lady in the green right here, your name is? Juliana. Juliana, and all the way up back from Juliana, you guys are group one, okay? All of you on this side of the room are group one, and you can just talk to the people next to you, and I just divided you guys, and you're together, right? So your name is Ian. 
Ian, all the way up behind Ian, you guys are going to be in group two. And then we'll come across, how we divide it up? Lady in the white right here. What's your name? Yeah? Lisa. Lisa. So from Lisa over, you guys are going to be group three, right? Yes. So the zealot phase, it's pretty easy to deal with a zealot. They're so happy. You know, you don't really need to change anything about them. You just need to keep them being positive and accept that they are. But group one, if you were dealing with people in the irritability phase, I want you guys in smaller groups, we'll call you up by rows. Just discuss. You can talk with the group behind you as well, and then we'll just call out things. Okay? What would you do in your organization for somebody that was in irritability to try to make sure that they still maintained positivity in the organization? Okay? We're going to try to think how to move people up. Okay? Then we have the withdrawal phase. Okay? So the group in the middle here. We're talking about the people that are withdrawing from the organization, that are not, no longer participating. Yes, we're having a company cookout. No, I would never come to that. Okay? Those are the people that we're dealing with. And then group three, this is the zombie phase. These are our super talented individuals that have given their heart and soul to the organization, and it has sucked them dry. What do we do to try to keep them with us so that we don't lose that talent? So you can talk to each other that you're with. You can turn around and talk to each other. I'm going to give you four minutes just to quickly come up with some little ideas and then we'll do shout outs, okay? Go. Okay, everybody finish up. I'm gonna pull you back in. Okay, let's start with group one that talked about irritability. Who in group one would like to give an example, something that you could do to keep somebody from going further down? Uh, Go ahead. Um, <laughs> we did this the other day. Uh, the manager, it was probably about 11.30, and he said, okay, I'm taking orders. I'm out and get ice cream, and we're going to have ice cream before lunch. And we did. And it wasn't a question of whether you wanted to. You were going to be there, you were going to eat ice cream. And we just took 10, 15 minutes, and we all took different scoops of ice cream and ate, and that was before lunch. And we even had vegan options. Awesome. Always have dessert first. Very but it just helped. We'd all been working hard in the morning, and it just set the tone for the rest of the day. And that little thing really makes the difference. Yep, just that small thing. You had them. So we talked a little bit about, you know, if there's specific behaviors. Can you hear? Can you all hear her? <laughs> Go ahead. You can hit the microphone right there in front of you, and that will help. Hold it. It's uh, not good. Oh, the thing that says push. Uh, push. <laughs> So we talk about uh, like, you know, if they're specific, if it's a single staff member or their supervisor, like talking about the specific behaviors that we've been seeing, but then also talking about to them, like, hey, is there something bigger going on that's like underlying these specific behaviors? How can we, yeah. The supportive conversations, yeah, at whatever level that you're at, I'm your coworker or whoever, yeah? So food, supportive conversations. <laughs> Uh, I'm a coworker. Had a great example of someone uh, in, in his organization that had reached this point, and he kind of bombarded her with all the positive stuff that we do as an organization. Because we do lose that all the time everywhere we work. We just kind of focus on all the stuff we're not doing, and mm -hmm. we kind of lose sight that we're doing more good stuff than bad stuff. So we just kept kind of leading her back to the mission, leading her back to what we do, and, and bombarding her with all the success stories and hold on to that. Excellent. Anybody else on this side? Group one? Yes. Humor. Yes. Um, and there was one day, it was just one of those everything, every minute, uh, there was something else we were dealing with. And I said, OK, we need a laugh. And I don't know, there's a YouTube channel called Aaron's Animals. Mm -hmm. And I just love it. He, he's got a cat named Prince Michael and another cat named Phil. And he makes these really funny. They're usually three to five minutes, so you can watch them, and get a laugh, and uh, so that's what we did. Excellent. Humor. Okay, group two. We were in withdrawal. What are we doing to help people that are in withdrawal? Go ahead. So we have been to the executive director, she's a volunteer. 
Can you hit your mic button? Sorry, it's a huge room. It's, it's, there you go. Uh-huh. I have to hold it down. but they don't get paid, they have less say-so, they have staff who can sometimes feel they're in the way or whatever. And one of the things that we had talked about was allowing them to have more of a voice with the understanding that they can't change policy necessarily, they can't have that level of influence, but they should have some buy-in. So maybe if they're getting to that phase, they feel like they're not important. Strategy session where, you know, every quarter or whatever, the volunteers get together and are allowed to have a strategy session where they can buy in with some new policy or procedure that's, you know, nothing major, but that gives them ownership. Yep, you can learn a lot from volunteers. Anybody else? Yes. Asking them, <laughs> asking them to help you. Yep. Yes, you might be the best dog walker in the building, but telling them you need their help is really important. Especially coming, like, as the executive director, if you ask somebody for something, oftentimes they feel, like, elevated by that. Wow, she noticed me, and she needed my help. Because sometimes, being the executive director, you got so much going on, you're running through the building, you're stressing out, and you miss that piece, that one piece of saying to somebody, hey, you know, why don't you come help me? I really could use some help with this. Or could you go give some extra attention to whichever dog? You know, take him out for a walk. Go spend some time in the park with him. That would be awesome. Um, we talked about, sorry. Um, a bunch of them have been covered, but uh, like exclusivity, and maybe if there was a recent event, sorry, uh, exclusivity, <laughs> inclusivity. Um, Cut him out. <laughs> a recent event or um, something that happened that was in incredibly stressful, uh, maybe talking about it as a group and not just with one individual, but knowing that someone might be more affected, but kind of having a, just reaching out and saying, you know, this is how did this make you feel, this is how we're feeling, so people know they aren't alone in it. Um, and then just talking about other resources, like if there's an employee assistance program or um, just saying, hey, these resources exist. If you want to talk to someone outside of work, um, just offering those resources up to people as well. Very important. We've kind of lost the art of talking to each other a lot of the time. Just asking somebody, hey, are you okay? Is often a, makes a big difference in the day. And then taking the time to listen. Don't ask somebody if they're okay and then go running down the hallway because that's worse than never asking them if they're okay because then they just feel like it didn't matter to you. So when you think about that, if you ask somebody that kind of a question, make sure you take that minute to listen. So Joaquin Phoenix, an actor, said this. And it kind of hit me the wrong way, because I do this, I guess. And it's not the same as saying humans should be kind to animals, right? Because I've seen it take a lot away from humans to be kind to animals, right? We go down a slope sometimes being kinder to animals than we are to ourselves. So it is a good thing for humans to be kind to animals, but they also have to be kind to themselves. And sometimes it takes too much away from you. And so you have to keep your eyes on that so that you can continue to be kind to animals. So sorry, Joaquin, not on the same page. So how many of you have a Fitbit or something like that? Apple Watch, some kind of a device that tells you how you're living your life? <laughs> OK. So. I find these things really useful because sleep is so important to the work that we do. Um, when you are sleeping, really, really sleeping and not thinking, and you're, do you ever have one of those nights where you're just laying there all night long and you're actually working in the kennel all night and you're worrying about the cruelty case you've got to work tomorrow and you just can't believe that this kennel's still dirty and you've been through it twice and you've already told them how to clean it, all those things still going on in your head when you're home? So sleep disruption, not sleeping well, can lead you down the path that we were just on where we were trying to pull people back and forth, just encouraging enough sleep. And this device will tell you how much sleep you got when you woke up during the night. And it's quite interesting to look at all the times that you woke up during the night that you may not even realize where you lifted yourself out of deep sleep 
REM sleep, and you were not managing your stress well. So sometimes when you're having an exhausting week and you can look back at this little device and find that it's telling you why. Hey, you hardly slept last night. You think you did, but you really didn't. You were awake over and over and over during the night. So it ha in, in these studies that they did about people that have had compassion stress or PTSD, it was discovered that while you have the REM sleep, you guys have studied REM sleep back in school where your eyes do the little rapid eye movement while you're sleeping and you're really in a deep, deep sleep, that's when you process in your system all the stress and the difficult things that have happened to you. So if you never get to that stage or stay in that stage long enough, it gets trapped and you carry that around inside you and you can't get rid of it because it's trapped inside you and you never sleep quite long enough to let it go. So for all of us, they're in these really stressful situations, whether you're a student in school trying to get through, you want to be a veterinarian or whatever subject you're studying and you've got all this stress of I've got to get through this. Hey, I made it to the Ivy League. I've got to graduate from this amazing school because I'm fortunate enough to be here. That's a big stressor. Some of us are volunteering. We're, we're bottle feeding kittens and we want all those kittens to survive and we're getting up every couple hours to feed them and we're worried whether they're going to survive or not. And maybe we're hardly sleeping at all, even when we lay back down between bottle feedings. Those things are important to know, and this device will tell you a lot about how your self-care is. Don't take your problems home with you. I can't tell you how many shelters that I've been in where when you ask people what they do for compassion stress, like how they handle that and what kind of things, it's not the ice cream party, it's the, oh man, we have these booze ups at so-and-so's house, and it's a blast, we all get wasted. You know, and it's like, well, what do you like the next week? Oh, we're exhausted, but it's so fun. But really, it's a way of blocking all this out. And if you find that people that you know are talking about drinking at home often, that they're getting drunk when they're at home, that when they get home, the first thing that they do is go and find something to drink, or they're always behind the dumpster having a cigarette, those are all signs of great stress as well. So you want to try to, when you walk out the door and you lock the door behind you, that's it until tomorrow, because there's always going to be more to do tomorrow. So, so this is a, the touchy-feely part of this, is that if you don't care for yourself, if you don't have those emotions left to give to the animal, if you become zombie-like and you're just like, get in the kennel, slam the door. Seen it happen to people? Where people who used to touch every animal with the gentlest touch that they could become pushy and ugh, another one that doesn't know how to walk on a leash, those kind of things. That's because you're not caring for yourself, and we need to encourage that in each other. I can't say that enough, so that you have something left to give. So if you think about yourself as seven-year-old me getting the raccoons out from underneath the tree, I remember sitting with my first dog and watching TV for hours on end and just having my head on my dog, who would lay there and be my pillow for all of that time. I don't do that anymore because I don't have the time. But I look back on those times and think, what a wonderful bond I had with that dog. And sometimes I find myself going, okay, food for you, food for you, food for you, and you know, got to go do the next thing. And I try to stop myself and think, okay, so what am I going to do with the dogs today? Other than slap their food bowls down and run out the door. So even for your own pets, it's really important that your compassionate mission doesn't take you away from why you're really in this, because you love your own dogs too. One of the things about Facebook is watching all of us post and tell each other, you know, I lost Phoebe today. I'd had her 25 years. She was my rescue from my first shelter. Like these fantastic stories of people's bond with their pets that do this for a living, that deal, deal with creating all of those bonds for all of the people who we give animals to. And we share each other's heartbreak in these little Facebook posts of, I'm so sorry for your loss. Wow, I remember Phoebe, when I came to your house, she did this or she did that. It's wonderful that we share those things in a, in a network and we care about each other and how much pain we go through when we lose them, our own personal ones. But when you look back, did you give, did you, were you really with that animal as much as you really wish that you'd been, or were you always thinking about the one that was back at the shelter? Sometimes when people think about it that way, they're much more able to self-care because now you've just linked it to, I need to be with Phoebe, right? I feel that way about my horses, that when I'm out in the barn, um, it's something special to be out there. It gives you a different, horses have something about them that give you that different emotional support feeling than a dog or a cat. They all have very different emotional support. We had a, a meeting 
at the A where we were talking about this, really talking about self-care, and we were in a Zoom meeting. Has anybody ever done Zoom? Where you have, you're all on camera, you know, it's like FaceTime for, but times 20. So you're all sitting there, and I said that what I did for self-care was go to the barn, and the guy who was facilitating the meeting thought I said that I went to the bar. And so he immediately jumped in and was like, no, no, that's not really good for you. I was like, no, no, the barn, nah, not the bar. <laughs> okay, so it's time to take a little break. We're coming back at four or just before, if you come back before, and we're going to start working on some of these sheets.